Ladies and gentlemen, the session is about to start. We invite all our guests to take their seats. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the session is about to start. We invite all our guests to take their seats. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone, thank you so much for being here um, and welcome to the Finance in Common Summit 2021, uh, our second day of this fabulous summit that we are so happy to be here. Welcome to everyone here in person, welcome to everyone following us uh, digitally uh, online. Um, public development banks uh, with a financial footprint above 10% of global investments every year play a critical role in aligning finance with sustainable development goals, uh, as, as we have seen, as we will continue to see today. So this plenary will be indeed about the potentials and the results of a new sustainable roadmap for the coalition. 
Uh, so to start off the session, without further ado, I'd like to call to the floor Antonella Baldino. She is a Chief International Development Finance Officer for Casa Depositi e Prestiti. You have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I'm honored to welcome you to this plenary session to present the potential results and the new roadmaps for the Finance and Common Global Coalition. In this year celebrating the father of the Italian language, Dante Alighieri, let me start with one of the most evocative lines of its masterpiece, The Divine Comedy. E quindi uscimmo a rivedere le stelle, and thence we come forth to see again the star. Emerging from the darkness, Dante prepares the threat uh, to a new path of light and uh, hope. This metaphor, in a way, well describes the situation we are facing today. Our limits have been tested on multiple fronts from health to climate change, and we now need to concretely move forward to, sustainable, to a sustainable future, combining growth with resilience and development with the preservation of global public goods. A context where, from the perspective of uh, public development banks, it becomes apparent that we have uh, a challenge to deal with we have an imperative to address it and an opportunity to overcome it. So a challenge, an imperative, and an opportunity. Let us begin with our challenge, long-term economic and social sustainable development, which really is the defining challenge of our generation. As a compass, the SDGs set out a crystal clear vision of the world we want to achieve by, by 2030, and provide us with a roadmap to the way forward. We are one year into the decade of action, and while some progress has uh, been made, financing uh, the ambitious SDGs has not advanced uh, at the right size and uh, at the right speed. So this is the challenge, and then we come to the imperative, the timing and the scale of our intervention. We need with two major implications for our work. First, to meet the investment gap, we need new ways of financing, a financing plus model, leveraging on blending and the private sector more. And second, we need to come together to build and maintain a complementary strategy, a concrete network linking financial institutions, corporate, donors, national and multinational institutions, civil society. So given the challenge we are facing uh, and the imperative uh, to mobilize an increasing volume of uh, good finance uh, at the right pace, public development banks uh, turn out to be an opportunity. Some key numbers uh, which came to light in the summit previous session uh, paint a vivid picture of the scale and the strength of the PDPs represented in the Financing Common Global Coalition. More than 500 PDPs based in more than 150 countries uh, with a total asset of more than $18.7 trillion accounting for more than 10% of the annual global investments. Figures that are in continual growth and which reveal the potential of the PDBs. A cohesive ecosystem that share a common long-term view on what it takes to implement development in the right way. The same striking similarity of a target and approach that can be found in other stakeholders represented here today, bilateral, multilateral, the UN, the EU, regional organization, the WTO, the NGO, foundations, export credit agency, and the private sector. With each of, with each of us playing our respective strengths. And this meeting makes the case for reinforcing our shared strategies in supporting sustainable growth and development impact 
in creating a network infrastructure to better consolidate our role as PDBs within the international financial architecture. And the reason we are all here today is because we all believe that we can take this partnership to the next level, rising our sight, I would say, to the star, returning to the Dante's metaphor. This year's summit can be a turning point uh, in our journey, a moment where our coalition and its, and its stakeholder can truly deliver a spark of uh, creativity to move forward as one, reshaping our thinking. We must think sustainability, about how to have lasting impact. We must think uh, results, how to get the highest returns from scarce resources. We must think equity to reduce inequality and stimulate inclusive growth. So we can do it. For future generation, we have to do it. And working together, we will do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antonella Baldino. Thank you. And now I'd like to call up on stage uh, Adama Marico. Uh, uh, he is the Secretary General of the Finance and Commons Summit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, working together, we will do it. Uh, of course, uh, thank you very much, Antonella. Uh, from the fixed Secretary General perspective, I would like just to Again, thank everyone uh, and uh, all the coalitions we have gathered uh, for this last year. This morning plenary session is essential. It's essential because uh, we have been commanded by either new, the G20 and last year's signatories to show results, and we are results oriented. This morning, our expectation is, of course, uh, very high. And there is excellent panels. I am sure that they will meet the ambition. Regarding the first panel on the SDGs and Paris Agreement alignment, I would like to say that the meeting the agenda 2030 requires the alignment of all finance with the SDGs, which is the raison d'etre of, of the Finance in Common Coalition. We formed this vow last year in the first Finance and Commerce Summit. We are here to strengthen the partnerships because we have to do it together with all actors that have active voice and that are the driving forces of such an alignment. The first step is to understand what alignment is, what alignment with the the, the SDGs mean for PDB, for the public development banks. The second panel will take stock of what has been done over the last 12 months and illustrate the progress we have done and the method we have implemented. The progress on the sectorial basis, eight sectors and topics covered by fixed coalitions. The four pillars of the new global framework, framework we had built and discussed it last year. The SDG and Paris Agreement alignment, of course, the national policies, the private investment and trade finance. We also are here to illustrate the progress about the PDB common practices on cooperation, transparency, governance, environmental and social standards, debt discipline, and the management of risk, including climate risk. We also are here to illustrate the progress about the institutional and macro issues, our mandate, the economic models, the regulation, and the access to international finance. Of course, within a year, we cannot have done all of this, but you will, found, you will find in the public annual report we have published this morning, and I'm glad to give this news, you can find the first annual report of PDBs and the Finance in Common Coalition online on our website. 
And thanks to the third panel, we will discuss how further implement of our common objective and with the crucial, crucial support of our new members and partners. Antonella mentioned the ECAs and it is a tremendous breakthrough uh, that we have joined collective discussion with uh, export credit agencies and export finance institutions. Looking forward to listening such a our distinguished guest today. I will stop here. Thank you, thank you everyone. See you later. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Secretary General. All right, well, uh, this, uh, it's time now to start with our distinguished panels, as we were saying. Um, so uh, the first panel will be dedicated to one of the greatest challenges facing our world, which is climate change. Uh, as we all know. So this panel will focus on the rationales and the ways uh, to harmonize approaches, to develop tools and methodologies among the key players in the financial community. Um, essentially, what can we do to make public development banks action consistent with sustainable development goals and with the Paris Agreement? Uh, so to discuss this topic, I'm happy to welcome on our stage uh, our distinguished panelists, so Sébastien Treyer, <coughs> director of Idri and the European Think Tanks Group, welcome. Uh, and um, Sergio Guzmao Shudowski, I apologize if my pronunciation is not, <laughs> President of Banco de Desenvolvimento de Minas Gerais, BDMG. Thank you, welcome. Uh, Ambroise Feyol, Vice President of the European Investment Bank. Thank you, welcome very. Uh, and we have Javier Diaz Fajardo, President of Banco Dex. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, all right. And uh, we will have online Simon Zadek, Chair of Finance for Biodiversity. Uh, he will be connected remotely. Hello. Welcome. Uh, all right. So uh, we can begin the session. So I would begin uh, with you, Monsieur Treyer. Um, there is a need to propose a common definition of SDGs alignment. Um, could you help us to better understand this concept and provide concrete examples of how there could be an alignment? Thank you very much. Um, so, so maybe just to, to remind you that uh, what we had already accounted for one year ago was a very, um, uh, a, a very in interesting set of innovative practices for SDG alignment among the public development banks, but also the, the, the challenges for progress, the gap to alignment that was still there. Uh, and so we have mobilized the community of think tanks, uh, the European Think Tank Group of Development, which is uh, IDRI from Paris, EIE in Italy, German Development Institute in, uh, in Germany, ECDPM in Brussels and the Netherlands, Elcano in Spain, ODI in Britain, so European think tanks, but also working on, on uh, other regions. Uh, to identify the practical starting points to make uh, SDG alignment more operational uh, and also to contribute to a kind of a learning process accompanying the, the fixed coalition uh, by external think tanks analysis and, and, and proposals. So I, I will just uh, in a few words say what we mean by the, the, what, what is the definition, what we mean by SDG alignment uh, and, and really in some banks uh, you see the operational team saying well, it's complicated to align oneself with 17 objectives. Right. What we mean by uh, SDG alignment, uh, the alignment with Agenda 2030, is to, that the bank, the whole of a bank approach to incorporate uh, the transformation to a low carbon, resilient, biodiversity positive and equitable socioeconomic model for the territories and the different sectors. Uh, and that means that you need to incorporate this transformative vision in all the financial decisions in the business model and the project cycles. So this alignment with long-term transformation is really different from just earmarking specific projects with respect to one specific uh, SDG, but it's really about the transformation that, 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 that matters. Um, and and um, it's also about coherence between the different objectives, environment, socioeconomic. So how can you really build um, uh, a strategy, a contribution of the PDB to the development of a territory to make it both good for uh, more equity and more environment as well as, as economic growth. 
So we, in order to make that happen, what we have identified is that we need also to, to propose some operational principles for, for the banks to, uh, to enter that process. And I will just uh, give a few examples of the four principles. The first principle is, to, uh, is that we need to have leadership uh, to lead internally and foster a sustainable development culture, the culture of Agenda 2030 within the organization. Uh, and so the, the basic uh, necessity is really leadership from the top. Uh, we've seen that this is really necessary for that to, to and, and we will have probably examples with my co-panelists. Uh, it's also about qualifications, performance appraisals within the organization. Uh, and we've seen that in, in the Scottish Development Bank that they have hired people with the uh, capacity to, to, to work on these uh, uh, interconnections between uh, the SDGs. It's also about the governance structure, uh, but also how you also uh, pilot uh, the financial intermediaries with whom you, you work. This is just the first principle, leadership and, and uh, a, a, a sustainability culture in the organization. The second principle is uh, to develop a holistic strategy and a long-term vision for the bank which means that specifically for the PDB uh, in its uh, ecosystem, what is the specific added value of that public development banks in order to contribute to the transformation to a low carbon, biodiversity positive and, and uh, equal uh, development for that territory. Uh, in that regard, uh, it's really about defining either adjusting, aligning the existing strategic vision or redeveloping a new vision for uh, as a guiding star. I mean, uh, Antonella was talking about we need to look at the, at the stars and this is really <laughs> how can you embody in the strategic vision of the bank uh, what is the, how, how the bank intends to contribute specifically in its added value to, the, uh, to reaching SDGs. The third principle, uh, so leadership and culture, uh, long-term vision is really to mainstream uh, SDG alignment in the priority and, and priorities in the internal operations. And that we have specific examples of how you can do that in proje at project level, pipelines of projects, portfolio alignment. Uh, you can do that with categorization, with dif also differentiation depending on the context of intervention. It's also both ex ante and ex post analysis. You particularly need to inter integrate that in sectoral policies, and I think Adama mentioned that as, as something very important. Uh, and you can also have uh, exclusion criteria uh, or integrate particularly the SDG alignment in your uh, impact assessment process, because that's very important for the capacity to, to build that into the culture of the organization. Uh, for, because as, as it was said, SDG attainment is the raison d'etre, uh, so you need to have that as a, the, 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 the center of your impact assessment. Fourth and last principle, uh, you, you really need to mobilize and catalyze truly transformative investments. By catalyzing, that means um, that you need to, the, the bank needs to, uh, with the, the, my colleague, uh, Maria Alejandra, who is actually responsible for the study because she did a great work in, in preparing this and I'm just her spokesperson now. She proposed to, to say, you need to transition, you need to change from transactions to transformations. So rather than being a, a transaction agent in your ecosystem, in your territory, you need to become the transformative agent in that, uh, uh, as a PDB, uh, because you are really at the heart of the ecosystem of partners, both with your financial and non-financial services. So you need to engage in policy dialogues, for instance, with the, 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 the local authority or the, the national authority. Uh, you need to have, of course, project preparation facilities. You could, uh, that's an, another example, uh, but it's also the way that you interact with your intermediary. So, so this is just an ecosystems approach that is very important and the role of the PDB uh, can really change from transactions to transform, being an agent of transformation. So my last point is to say many of the PDBs that uh, my colleagues have analyzed uh, and that are present at the uh, Financing Commons Summit uh, have very interesting uh, individual innovations on one of these principles, for instance. And what you, we need to try and force is, in foster is to, to make that it becomes now a whole of a bank approach where all, uh, each PDB tries to implement the four principles and, and the four entry points at the same time. And this is why we believe that uh, such a summit is extremely important. The community of FIX is very important for mutual learning uh, and, and also IDFC um, as, as a way uh, to, to really be the place where you could have championship, mutual championship to make that progress. So SDG alignment can seem strange from the beginning. I've tried to show that it's uh, very concrete that you have operational entry points for that. Thank you. So coherence, coordination, and to be the transformers. Uh, you make it sound simple, but uh, I'm sure it's much more complex than that. But thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to move on to uh, Mr. Shudolsky. Shudolsky? 
Suchadolsky. I'm sorry. Or okay. Guzmao, it's I apologize fine. <laughs> very much for that. Um, I, I'm actually very curious about your region and, and if you could tell us uh, a bit more about how your, your organization is playing a role in sustainable development, obviously, in your region, if you could explain more and share with us basically the ecosystem in uh, which you're operating and what the next steps will be. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, today uh, again, especially with uh, the partners uh, around uh, this panel. Uh, um, the Development Bank of Minas Gerais is about to uh, celebrate its 60th anniversary uh, just in a few months. Um, and I have been serving as its uh, CEO for almost four years now, just about to enter my fourth and last year of my uh, term. It's, it's very interesting to be here and to see how the community has evolved and especially taking account of the challenges. And I need to reference not only the pandemic, but also the fact that we are in the decade of action of the SDGs, of the Agenda 2030. We are in a, just a few weeks uh, away from COP26, and I think everybody is very excited and even maybe a, a little bit anguished about what the results will be. So I should uh, start framing uh, and uh, 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 stating that although we are a last mile bank, working in a particular subnational uh, state of Brazil and the surrounding states, so we are a regional development bank in a, in a sense, we are fully aligned with the three main international agendas that guide uh, development banks' uh, programs, because Brazil is part of these three agendas, which is Addis Ababa Action Agenda, uh, the Development uh, Finance Agenda, the Paris Agreement and the Agenda 2030. All of three were born in 2015, so we are six years into this agenda and there is a lot of stock that we can take into it. And they definitely inform and, and orient our programs. Following into Sebastian's uh, remarks in the uh, four operational principles, it's interesting because I think we pretty much have followed the principles since 2019. So we basically started our ter uh, term at the bank, aligning our strategy with the SDGs, uh, providing from the very first month uh, training and, and international meetings. Uh, bear in mind that uh, in September of 2019, uh, I had already joined ALIDES, the Latin American Development Bank Association board, and, and we were able uh, to promote the first meeting of chief economists of development banks in Latin America. And we had more than 30 institutions from all over the region, including from Colombia, Javier is, is here, EIB was there, uh, Enrique Garcia, the former president of CAF was there, and therefore we started building this uh, uh, different relationships even before the pandemic. So when the pandemic hit, we already had uh, changed the working culture of the bank. And I'm, I'm also talking about uh, technical expertise and changing even our credit uh, risk, uh, adapting to uh, embed the climate risk analysis. And we had some incentives, and it's good that Ambrose is here because in October 2019, we celebrated our first on-landing program with the European Investment Bank, a 100 million euro program for climate finance. Uh, we started doing disbursements and it, we were very quick in doing more than 50% of the disbursements in the first year. And EIB was a very important partner because they provided flexibility for the finance line so that we could use it for emergency purposes during COVID. So actually what we did is that we combined the emergency programs, so the counter cyclical programs on the last mile with a, a deepening of the sustainability aspect on our portfolio. So we were able to achieve 58% of our credit portfolio aligned with the SDGs. This also provided us with the opportunity of designing a framework 
uh, SDG framework, publicizing it on our website. And by December 2020, we were able to launch the first issuance of an SDG bond from a Brazilian bank, commercial or development one, in the stock exchange of New York. So we basically registered at the DTCC, and uh, we had the help of uh, IDB Invest, the private arm of the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, to do so. So the environment in which we operate is very rich. Uh, we have 31 DFIs in Brazil. I'm the president of the Development Bank Association of Brazil. We have over 200 uh, in all over Latin America and the Caribbean. And we are basically doing very uh, concrete and rapid exchanges, especially through the launch of the Subnational Development Bank Alliance, Alianza de Desarrollo, that is now a reality and it's a concrete and Im immediate deliverable from Financing Common Summit number one. So we launched that uh, together with Rémi Rieu from the French Development Agency, with Idri, with uh, Sébastien and, and, and the team, and with uh, Fonds Mondial pour le Développement des Villes, FMDV. Uh, and now we have a steering committee with 21 uh, different partners and over 200 participants. So this is the reality. We are exchanging with FIDA from Mexico, with Banco Dex from Colombia, with Cofide from Peru, and see what each other are doing, learning from it, and being able to really implement all these agendas that are discussed in Geneva, in Washington, D.C., at the last mile on the ground in developing countries. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is very rich and, and full examples of what's going on. So I thank you very much for that. Um, I'd, I'd like to move on to Mr. Fayol, um, a Vice President of the EIB. Um, the EIB has developed its Climate Bank Roadmap, the 2021-2025. Uh, could you explain how this strategy improves the policy coordination of products that are related to climate change? Okay, good morning. Um, let me start by thanking a lot uh, GDP, uh, Antonella, uh, Dario. Dario was uh, for a very long time a colleague of mine in, in Luxembourg, and uh, we miss him in Luxembourg, but we are very happy that, uh, that he can chair GDP, uh, GDP now. Uh, and it's also great to, um, to have an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to see uh, friends that are well known by the institution, but not by me. I heard a lot about you, uh, Sergio, in, uh, in Luxembourg and the great uh, partnership that we have with, uh, with, with, your, with your bank. Uh, and this is also excellent that we have this kind of opportunities to, uh, to exchange, to meet, to learn from each other uh, among, uh, among public development banks. Uh, so thanks a lot to, uh, to the initiative that has been launched, uh, which is a fantastic one by by Remy, uh, Remy Ryu and, uh, and, and, and AFD. Um, what, we, what we have embarked on actually is pretty close to, uh, to what Sebastian has described in terms of methodology of, uh, of moving on alignment on, on SDGs. Um, and um, so let me just say how we approach the issue of climate action and environment sustainability and the two goes together for us. Um, and, uh, and how holistic it is. Um, we have started to, uh, to transform EIB, which was a, a big bank, public bank, for financing mostly big projects in infrastructure. Uh, so very long term, low cost, uh, uh, to transform it into a, a climate bank of the European Union. And that is, of course, consistent with both EU policy goals and especially the EU Green Deal of, uh, of Ursula von der Leyen and the SDG uh, goals that we, that we of course, uh, uh, aim at achieving in, in all our financing. And how we have done that? We have done that through a combination of quantitative and qualitative targets. Uh, quantitatively, which is not the most important uh, here, what we have done is basically to increase significantly the share of what we finance under climate, uh, to try to attract financing from especially private sector in, and, and other public institutions in our financing to, uh, 
mobilize one trillion of investment in the critical decade, which is to uh, 2030. Uh, and what we have done qualitatively, which I think is, is more interesting um, uh, for, for, for such an audience here, is to align all, all our activities, all our projects on uh, the Paris alignment. So what it means is, yes, we have moved the, the share of what we, what we are going to do in, in financing climate and environment projects to 50% by 2025, and that is ambitious, and this is, uh, it means that we, you need to put climate in everything you do, basically, uh, and to do more projects related to climate. But if you do projects that are going in opposite to, uh, to, to the Paris alignment targets of climate change, uh, with the other 50%, then it means that uh, what you do is, is meaningless. And uh, so for that, what we have done is to decide that all our projects have to be Paris aligned. Uh, and that has implications. That has implications that there are things that we are going to do much more, and there are things that we are going to do less, and there are things we are going, that we are going to stop. And for us, we were, as I said, a big bank for our infrastructure, we are going to stop financing new airports because we think that it is difficult to do that and be consistent with the goal of achieving the climate neutrality by 2050 that is, uh, that is also in line actually with, uh, with, with, the, with the Paris Agreement. So that's what we have tried to do as a first step. And that is in place. And now we are moving to the next step, which is the Paris alignment for counterparts. What do you do when you have uh, a clear project that is green, mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, uh, charging station for electric vehicles, but that is promoted by a company that is not green? Greenwashing. Uh, and so do you do it because the project is green? Don't you do it because the company is not Paris aligned? Or do you try to find the middle way? And what we have tried to, um, and what we are going to announce in Glasgow actually, is that we are going to set um, criteria mm -hmm. for us to continue to do business with those companies when they have projects that are extremely interesting. For example, very innovative one. We know, we know that we need innovation to achieve the climate targets. And these companies are often very well equipped with excellent and skilled experts that have the ability to do this kind of breakthrough technology change that we need. And that they have a plan. They have a clear plan for uh, changing their, uh, their policy to be, uh, to be aligned with, uh, with the goals that we have, not only for 2050, but also shorter term by, by 2030. And we will do that. Uh, so we will propose that uh, in, in Glasgow. Uh, this is the next step. And there are other many things that we are working on because really when you look at climate change, you cannot, uh, you cannot do that uh, either alone and you cannot do that only on part of what you are doing. Uh, we are going to propose, for example, a plan for adaptation. This is the first time that we do that at the bank. Uh, to, be, to, be, to be clear, we are a bank that is much more active on mitigation than on uh, adaptation. And we think, to some extent, unfortunately, because it is uh, the consequence of climate change that already is there, but this is where we are. So we need to do more on adaptation and working on, uh, on cities, for example, on, uh, and, and we've seen that this year, uh, this year also in Europe. Uh, Africa is, of course, the, the, the most impacted continent. Uh, but uh, you see the flooding, you see the fires, uh, you see the, and you already see the, the consequences of, cli of climate change. So we are going to do also uh, this. We uh, have announced, actually, with Remy, uh, because the uh, important part is also tracking. Tracking, so to make sure that uh, what, you, what you refer to is something that is clear, understood, and shared. 
so uh, we have developed um, a methodology which is called the principles that we have developed with MDBs and also with IDFC, uh, the group of bilateral banks that is, uh, that is chaired by, by, by Remy Ryu. And we have uh, announced uh, further principles on uh, climate change finance uh, tracking methodology. Uh, there are many things that are going on also on the funding side. Uh, it's not only the green bonds, it's uh, the sustainability bonds. So when you finance, for example, uh, a water project with bonds that are dedicated to that, this is not climate necessarily relative, it is environment. Yeah. It is SDG, clearly. And this is something that we have also developed. What we have also uh, tried to develop with... Uh, with a private company, uh, I'm just giving a few examples, but uh, like uh, Amundi, uh, it is uh, a big asset manager in Europe, with IFC, with EBRD, with Proparco, and with the Swiss Cooperation. Uh, is a project that we have seen that there are a lot of uh, green bonds issued in, uh, in, in advanced economies, and not that much in, in emerging and, and developing countries. And, and there are, great projects that are green in, in these geographies. So what you try to do is, uh, as a public bank, try to do a project to launch this market. So what we have uh, done is, we've told those financial institutions in emerging markets, issue green bonds with the methodology that is uh, the good one, we will buy these bonds. And we will show that there are great projects that are attached to that and that we can develop this cooperation. And let me finish by saying that uh, for later this year, actually, there is something that's going to be very important in Glasgow also, which is the announcement of what we call the long-term strategy, LTS instrument that has been approved at the G20, um, the G20 uh, summit in Venice in July. That is uh, an initiative to try also to help uh, those countries in, 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 in emerging and, and developing countries uh, that, that do need to put in place their strategy, long-term strategy for climate. And it is, of course, I mean, we need to discuss that with them. We need to, uh, to try to embark them uh, on, 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 this, uh, on this roadmap. This is a long-term roadmap. That's why it's called a long-term strategy. And that's something that we are going to, uh, to present in, uh, in Glasgow with other multilateral lateral development banks. One last word, don't forget biodiversity, which is a, a big challenge for the world. Uh, and it is going to be on the agenda for next year with uh, hopefully uh, a summit that will take place um, in, uh, in, in, in Kunming in China on, on dedicated to this. And I, I, I forgot one part that is very important, but I'll stop there. Uh, it is not only an issue about projects, it's not only an issue about uh, funding, it is also, uh, climate is an issue about uh, risk. Uh, and it comes actually from risk. So we approach the climate targets from risk approach. And that's something that we see more and more actually uh, shared by, by our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your uh, interesting presentation on bringing institutions and, and companies to, away from the dark side, let's say, and, and into this new world. Uh, I, I'd like to now uh, ask a question of Mr. Fajardo. Uh, thank you for being here. And you as well, I think, can give us an interesting perspective from your point of view. Um, so can you tell us what are the IDFC's main takeaways uh, to achieve alignment to SDSGs given that all the members are such different institutions. I think this is always a, a complicated thing. And, and what are, in your opinion, the biggest lessons learned, the biggest challenges that you face? Thank you very much. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I would also like to take uh, the time to thank CDP for hosting us, uh, have made us feel at home. So thank you, and thank you for being here in presence. It makes such a difference. Yeah. Uh, a year after, we were all locked up to see faces in person. So, so it's <laughs> wonderful to be here, thank you. Uh, so I guess one of the advantages of uh, representing a business development bank from an emerging market is that you really know when rubber hits the road. Mm. 
So, and, and this panel, by the way, is called Making PDB's Action Consistent with the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. Emphasis should be on action. Uh, to your question, we've done a lot of work at the IDFC level. We have a 10-year history. We have done the mapping. We have done the consulting. We've done a lot, and my colleagues have, have taken good time and, and great explanations as to everything that we have done. Uh, and I think we've done a lot on paper, mm -hmm. and now is the time that we begin to do more in terms of action and in terms of lending responsibly. So uh, I'll take just a few minutes to probably further uh, and explain that. Um, Bancoldex, the bank which I represent, was a pioneer issuing green bonds. I think we issued, our, we issued our first green bond four years ago. Three years ago, we issued our first social bond. Uh, and everybody, especially in the capital markets, loves the green bonds. Every, everybody is enticed by the idea of buying into the green bonds and the social bonds. But when you look at it from the bank's perspective, it's, that's the easy part. Mm -hmm. The hard part is actually getting the loan portfolio aligned with what you said you were going to do at the time you issued the bond. And that's a discussion that I have permanently with my colleagues within the bank, which is, okay, we have the funding. And in, in this environment of excess liquidity and low interest rates, I say this with all due respect, funding is easy. <laughs> the hard part is getting the money out to the projects that really need them. So, we, so everybody loves to stop at the part when the bond issuance was great. But then when you go and do the work, it becomes much, much harder. Now, if you put that into the context of an emerging market bank like some of us here represent, um, you actually have challenges that go beyond sustainability. When you talk about micro, small, and medium enterprises, these are very small companies that actually have a hard time surviving uh, uh, during the pandemic, after the pandemic. So it's hard enough just to survive uh, much harder still to bring sustainability and SDG alignment into the discussion. So that's one of the major challenges that we face. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I appreciate my colleagues from big banks, uh, but when you come to the smaller banks and the emerging markets, you know, these are the realities. So, and that by the way is a very nice challenge because, because when you look at it, you really have to put into action what all the mapping and all the, what we've done, this is the time to put into action. Let me give you other examples. Um, Colombia, the country which I come from, uh, our main export is oil, and our second main export is coal. So we, have, we, we haven't done a great job at diversifying at, at our export base. So how we go about uh, exploitation of oil and coal and other commodities, or Peru, Peru is copper, Chile is copper. So I think we need a big dose of reality in terms of putting the mapping together and making our uh, economic growth and economic recovery consistent with the SDG goals. It's a, it's a big gap that we have between everything that we've done and everything that we need to do. And maybe m my final example, not to take too much time, is um, we have just finished our uh, strategy at Bancoldex for the next four years. So we, 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 we have anticipated the 2022, 2026 four year strategy. And one of the main pillars is, of course, ESG, but not just in writing. <laughs> Our board mandated us to hire the staff that we need and make everything consistent with the SDGs. And that has to be uh, put into the DNA of the whole organization. And by that I mean when I go out with the commercial colleagues and, and, and finance motorcycles, we can't be financing old motorcycles. We need to be financing electric vehicles. We need to be financing what is clean and what is sustainable because we don't have too much time. Uh, 2030 seems to be further down the road, but it's not that much. A decade goes by really fast when, when you look at it. So I guess my take on all this, and, and I again thank the opportunity, is the fact that from the IDFC level, we've done a lot of great work over the past 10 years, and we need to do more. But, but it's pretty much there. The, the diagnosis is there, the studies are there. What we need to do, really need to do, is put that in, into action. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for this call to action. And yes, a decade, unfortunately, goes very, very quickly. Um, uh, if, if he's still with us, I'd like now to uh, call upon Simon Zadek. Um, 
Is he connected? Yes. Thank you. Still connected. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for being with us. Um, Chair of <coughs> Finance for Biodiversity. So um, your report on aligning development finance with uh, nature's needs is, is, is a very interesting and important milestone. Um, could you tell us more about it and, and what the role of public development banks could play in something like this? Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. My apologies that I can't be there. Um, it's a uh, a mixed bag these days in terms of which events one can find one's way to and which ones can't. And I would add my congratulations, um, not just to uh, AFD, the originators of Financing Common, but really at the progress that's been made over the last couple of years in beginning, as one of the earlier speakers said, to shape, if you like, not just a collection or aggregation of different public development banks, but begin to think about really what that community can do at scale together. Uh, so in that context, I wanted to pick up on uh, one of the remarks by uh, an earlier panelist, which is the importance of biodiversity, or let's say more broadly, nature. Um, and to really focus down on where we are on this particular journey, which obviously connects very importantly through to the climate agenda, but also connects, as others have said, through to the broader SDG agenda. Last year, Financing Commons released a paper on the eve of the first Financing Commons Summit uh, that uh, perhaps slightly cheekily looked across the aggregated balance sheet of all of the attending or signed up public development banks and asked, where are we on nature in what was then estimated to be an $11.2 trillion aggregated balance sheet. Now, needless to say, the data is not really there <clears throat> to undertake ground up analysis across such an extraordinary broad set of uh, investments and financing arrangements. Uh, and so in that first round, we argued that actually anyone could start um, from a top-down approach to analyzing nature-related risks, so both risks to the particular financial institution, but also broader nature dependencies and impacts, um, by looking across their balance sheet uh, and adopting, if you like, a uh, rough and ready um, view as to what the primary sectors were where there were high levels of nature dependency uh, and how to, if you like, classify different countries into which one was investing, or at times uh, sub-sovereign um, regions into which one was investing according to the likely level of nature risk, not only by virtue of the nature composition of the territory, but also by virtue uh, of, if you like, the degree of effective stewardship that that particular country was able to muster over the resources, uh, natural resources within their jurisdiction. And we published that piece at the end of last year. Um, and one of the things we called for was that every public development bank should commit to undertaking a balance sheet wide stress test of their nature risks, dependencies and impacts. And we were very pleased to see that although at the time of releasing the report, not a single public development bank actually had made such commitment, let alone undertaken it and published it. Uh, subsequent to that, AFD has led the way, as they have so often in this space, uh, in not only committing to such a balance sheet-wide stress test and report itself, um, but also encouraging others through IDFC and other parts of the FIC network to advance really a broader systematic view of the relationship between their financing activities and nature risks and outcomes. This year, we have published a second piece, uh, adopting a similarly slightly cheeky top-down approach, uh, given the paucity of data, both broadly, but also the paucity of data that is actually published and released by the community of public development banks about the nature relationships to their own balance sheet activities. Uh, so our top-down model, once again, is superbly approximate, and so we don't claim to great scientific discipline, but it highlights consistently with data 
from other parts of the financial community and the global economy. Over 40% uh, of uh, balance sheets of public development banks being highly dependent on nature. Uh, and very large numbers, financial numbers, obviously depending on how you build your valuation models of nature at risk as a result of that. Now, I just want to put these numbers into context, not only that they're growth simplifications, but that they obviously signal that the DFI or PB, uh, Public Development Bank community is investing in really important sectors for really critical parts of economic development where indeed nature is intricately interrelated to success as well as risk. So the fact that there's a high nature dependency is not a bad sign necessarily. It may be a very good sign if those investments are indeed being made in an effective way that maintains a core stewardship approach to the nature in question. But of course, we don't know if that's the case. We don't know because although there are many means by which public development banks make information available about what they do. Obviously, they have a relatively high level of transparency compared to many other parts of the financial community. We really don't know a lot about how their portfolios relate to nature. Uh, and it's probably time that we change that. And there are probably two ways of thinking about that particular agenda. Firstly, that it isn't about the one or two or five or 10 or 20 leading, if you like, public development banks that have invested most in connecting to the nature or climate or broader sustainability agenda. We're talking about a much, much wider community of financial institutions. And in fact, a far greater ecosystem of financial institutions and investments when you take their partners into account, many, many private financial institutions around the world. So a top-down simple approach is not intended necessarily for the best and the leaders, but is intended for the much wider group of players you know, that frankly can't or are not in a position at this stage okay. to handle the level of complexity of granulated, detailed, principle-based approaches that perhaps uh, some of their more advanced partners are able to take on. So our approach is quite simple. Every public development bank should commit to a nature-wide stress test of their balance sheets. There is no lack of data if you begin with a top-down approach that will give you a crude, admittedly, but very helpful approximation and guidance on where one needs to really focus one's attention. That begins to create a, PB, a, a public development bank wide community of practice rather than um, being led only by a few actors who are exemplary, but still a fairly small part of the show. One last piece to the story, um, perhaps one and a half, and then I'll move on. Firstly, of course, public development banks are in the main owned by us, governments, and make use, ample use of tax dollars. And so the shareholders of public development banks are the governments that we elect, the governments that represent us, and the very same governments that are in Kunming and about to go to Glasgow in making nature and climate commitments. So we believe it's not just a question of the leadership of public development banks, but the shareholders of public development banks, our governments, that should be frankly insisting, albeit politely, that the FIs that they are invested in, public development banks, fulfill that basic due diligence of balance sheet wide nature stress test and report publicly on the results, exemplifying what can be done and encouraging other FIs to do the same. Last point, we have a new raft of regulations coming into play on nature. Uh, they range from due diligence obligations that are mandatory and will require uh, companies and FIs to report on deforestation within their value chains. We have new thinking about the application of anti-money laundering regulation as it relates to environmental crime. We have a raft of new laws and financial regulatory developments that will all push the financial community to do exactly what it is that we are recommending. And we would only 
conclude by encouraging public development banks to really lead the way in showing not only how compliance can be enforced effectively, but also how real leadership across the financial community in assessing the impact of nature and managing it more effectively can be implemented in practice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we have to move on quickly to other panels. It's a very, very rich day. But thank you so much to our distinguished panelists. It was a pleasure uh, to speak with all of you and a pleasure to hear these really concrete examples uh, of what's going on in your world. Uh, thank you so much. All right. And now uh, we will move on to our next panel. We need a moment just to... Uh, make sure everything is COVID friendly. Um, but the second panel, in the meantime, I can, I can tell you a little bit more about it. Um, it will present the progress made by public development banks over the past 12 months um, to implement the joint declaration that was signed during the last edition of the FIX. So basically, we will talk about what has already been done, but we will also talk about results, which I think in this kind of event is extremely important. Um, to really, to really get to the point and talk about what's happening. Um, just a few seconds, and then I would like to welcome back uh, Adama Mariko, obviously Secretary General of the Finance in Common uh, Summit. Thank you. I think, yes, we can, we can go back. And then uh, Christian Leibach, CEO of KFW Development Bank. Welcome. Uh, and uh, then online we have Marcos Nito, Director of Finance Sector Hub United Nations uh, Development Fund, UNDP. So, thank you for being with us today. So this opens up, as we were saying, our second session and we would just uh, begin obviously with uh, Adama and we would love to hear about the progress uh, and, and obviously about what's actually happening. I think it's, uh, the microphone is there. But, uh, you have slides. Okay. I'm not sure that, uh... Yes, the slides. No, we have the slides. All right, thank you. All right. Um, so we, we'll try to keep it short. Yeah. Um, I actually, I, I told you about the, the, the report we have published. Uh, you have all this information online, and uh, we are glad to. What can I do? All right, okay. Is it on? Yeah. Sure. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, so um, just to thank the, the first panel, and it was really uh, insightful, and, and thank you very much for those you have shared. Uh, of course, PDBs, uh, Public Development Banks, they will collaborate, not for only ourselves, but with others, and of course, uh, it was very insightful to have also the, the testimony of Sergio for showcasing that the, the first outcome of Finance in Common is the collaboration, the partnership, uh, within the banking networks and uh, also uh, the fact that they can work together, co-finance together, share practices uh, and even exchange staffers. Um, also, uh, Zadek, the last uh, panelist, also said something very interesting. Uh, it's not about the top 20 uh, PDBs, you know, uh, we were talking about aligning and there is much more. Uh, you have. Uh, uh, big examples and uh, networks, IDFC is, is, is one of them. But this morning uh, we had the, the presentation of one of the major uh, outflow from the, 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 the finance in common deliverables. It was the finance in common database, uh, thanks to Regis and, and Jajun from uh, University of Beijing. Uh, they did a tremendous work of research uh, showing that we found now more than 527 public development banks around the world. Last year we were about you know, 450. Uh, but of course, the definition on, of what is the public development bank has been refined, uh, more, more precise. And the research is still ongoing, but having 500 banks uh, is, is something tremendous. And we have a lot to do. Um, those banks are regionally uh, in different uh, countries. Of course, they, it's missing one, one, one number. Uh, we haven't put the, the, the multilateral banks, um, there are one percent of them. If you do the math, you have the world, you know, big uh, banks, uh, World Bank, 
and uh, uh, other UN agencies doing finance. So it's 1% uh, of the number. And the banks are, you know, in Asia, in Africa, in Europe, uh, in Americas, uh, South America, North America, you have all those public development banks around the world in the financing common uh, uh, um, coalition. Um, we have 70% of them are national banks, right, uh, owned by countries. And if we, uh, you remember yesterday, we had banks from uh, Senegal, from Mali, from uh, South America, from Asia. Uh, all those banks are national owned, and their shareholders are, of course, the governments. And uh, I have heard also from the first panel that we have, we need clear mandates, and it's mandates from the, uh, you know, firstly from the government. So it's important when we speak about alignment to have, you know, the, these also clear mandates from uh, the governments owning these national banks. Nine percent of them are multilateral banks and the 21% 20, of, the, of the panel of you know, the 500 banks I, I, I was referring to are sub-national banks. Together, uh, the, 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 the coalitions uh, invest up to 2.3 trillion uh, commitment each, each year of new you know, uh, financing we brought to the, to the, to the, to the, to the financial system. The, combined balance sheet is more than 20 trillion, 20 trillion dollar in 2020. And the net contribution uh, of, uh, net contribution and the investment is up to 3.5 trillion dollars, uh, which is uh, up to, you know, more than 13% uh, of the worldwide investment. You will find all these data on our uh, website, of course. But it was important to refer to what we are talking about when we, when we talk about the public development banks. In the second slide, um, here we, we, we go through the, um, what is clearly the message uh, we wanted to share, the raison d'etre of the, 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 the public development banks. Last year, as I remind in my introduction, uh, uh, we have been commanded by, you know, the, all the signatories to do uh, some, you know, work in the substance. It's not just having these summits uh, and, 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 and speaking about ambitions. It's about produ producing deliverables and sharing it with uh, all the stakeholders, not just banks uh, for themselves, but also we work with civil society, as we said, private sector uh, and, and, and others. Financing Common is the only place we have known uh, as banks where we can found, find a sound and comprehensive, comprehensive map, mapping of community of practices around the world. Um, because that you, as you know, uh, all the you know, multilateral banks, they, they do this work too, to have uh, and compare what we are doing at the sectorial level. But having this mapping not for, from a regional perspective, but you know, worldwide perspective. Uh, having all those sectoral co coalitions uh, in which you can find banks, uh, European uh, uh, Commission agencies, uh, UN agencies, uh, uh, CSOs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, in, in a sectoral level is just in financial common. So we had to solve an equation uh, from the the the. the uh, the, the joint declaration, uh, which you know took 50 and plus commitments, is not just having those commitments. It was also to find a method on how we implement those commitments together with you know more than 500 banks. So it's not a, an easy task. We had to structure uh, the coalitions, and we found uh, you know some aspects. I, I, I said it in my introduction too: uh, sectoral and thema sectoral thematics, climate energy, biodiversity and assurance, health, social investment, gender, digitalization, and equality. Of course, we don't want to leave anyone behind. Four elements was about also the new global framework. So SDG alignment, we talked about it this morning. So it was also national policies, private investment, and trade finance. Also, we had to think about uh, the, the, the 
the quality of the PDB practices. Uh, it's not about just numbers. I've mentioned numbers and it seems to be big numbers when we talk about trillions, right? But at the national level, you don't have that much money um, in some countries we are you know, uh, speaking about small banks, but it's important uh, each dollar of those trillion, um, as much as possible, we have get them aligned. So the practices and the quality of the investment was something very important for us. And then uh, the, the, the key tools we had is how we cooperate, share transparencies and governance, how we discuss about environmental and, and social standards, how we discuss about how we approach our beneficiaries uh, and the countries we are funding, right, to whom we lend money. So it was important to, 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 to speak about depth discipline and of course the management of climate risks. It was important and, and our panelists mentioned it. The first annual report, as I said, is published. Uh, in a one year, we found that uh, PDBs has a, a, a clear counter-cyclical uh, role in uh, their capability to link between governments and private sector, their capacity also to uh, you know, join the global view and the, the ground you know, to reach when we talk, speak about uh, international um, framework and you know, international financing framework. It's hard to have you know, national banks at small country level to have their voice. So it was important to, to make the reach the, you know, uh, between uh, those big banks in Europe and also uh, give the access to you know, countries in, in Africa, in Asia, or in South America to have the access and the, and the collaboration with those big banks too. Um, we also joined the view on uh, having a, a, a short-term response uh, with a long-term perspective. So all the, the work in the academic and, and database, uh, all the research is of course in a perspective view, but it doesn't uh, mean that we don't specify in those coalitions how we can work together and have quick and sound responses uh, in front of crisis. Uh, of course, we will hear about uh, also what we have done on those sectorial level. So, for example, in, on agriculture coalition, uh, yesterday it, was, it has been said, uh, the Financing Common has launched the first platform for tra tracking agriculture related investments without, you know, within the, the, the network. On climate action, of course, it's important to, to, to remind those, those numbers. Um, when we speak about the importance of climate uh, and the, the fact that there is still a gap, we have also to say that within the IEFC, uh, this commitment has been taken to uh, improve their financing, uh, improve their financing level. So IDFC uh, collectively financed green project amount, amounting to $1 trillion from 2015, Paris uh, COP21, to between uh, 2015 and, and 2020. On biodiversity, the setting up of the development finance hub for task force, of the task force on nature related financial disclosure, TNFD, is a historic step, but not only for private, private sector, uh, it's only for you know, uh, the, the, the development banks because it includes now the, the global and public development banks. The Water Finance Coalition published a study on the role of PDBs in financing the water sector, which analyzes the involvement of PDBs in particular national banks in the sector in the sector's investment and provides a policy, policy recommendations. Of course, you can find this, public, uh, this document also on, on our website. On social, social investment, there has been major breakthroughs too. So I'm not gonna tell, it, you, tell you about that. I'm gonna share uh, maybe the floor with uh, uh, Monica Skatasta. Uh, if you may just give us some quick uh, reaction on how concretely you have been doing this. Maybe just share you a, a mic. You have been doing this this last 12 years and... Uh, uh, yeah. Do we, uh, is there a mic? 
No, because sometimes they have them. Okay. Come with us. Please. Yes, come up. Please come. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Whoops, I'm hitting the mic. The only thing is we are running a little bit late. Yeah, yeah. So but okay. other I than that, yeah. I'll move this way, please. Thank you very much. Now, I just wanted to share very briefly, uh, and I would like to thank the, the, the Finance Commons Summit and what it stands for, for this unique opportunity to bring together PDVs and, and other stakeholders. Uh, as regards the, the social coalition, uh, which the Council of Europe Development Bank is co-leading with the Agence Française de Développement, uh, a lot of thought has, going, has gone into really thinking of how we could have that transformational impact on the ground and to address the chronic underinvestment uh, in areas such as our health system, our education system, uh, social housing, the creation of, of sustainable and non-stranded jobs. Uh, and how can we bring together uh, the, and, and, and shine a light on the interlinkages between social crisis, the climate crisis, and the environmental crisis, as uh, the previous speakers have uh, indicated. A lot of work then went into really understanding the common view and, uh, and the common vision that the PDBs could have. And a lot of discussions took place in the first six months of the year. Uh, about 20 uh, entities, uh, including PDBs and, and uh, sponsors, other stakeholders, have gathered. We had the kickoff meeting in June, and, uh, and now we have members that include uh, ALIDE, the Latin American Association of Development Financing Institutions, uh, La Banque West Africaine de Développement, Fond Plata, and since yesterday, uh, the, the Turkish Industrial Development Bank, as well as the African Association of DFIs and the World Association of, uh, of DFIs, we're really going global. Uh, and a new sponsor as well, UNDP, that joined yesterday alongside the original sponsor, ILO and WHO. Why is this important? We're leveraging not just finance, we're leveraging knowledge. It was said the importance of leveraging knowledge, of sharing good practices, etc. And in the common work that has taken place, what we have identified is the need to have better definition and common definitions about social investment. These differ across PDBs. And it's important to have a common definition if we want to count, if we want to assess gaps, if we want to understand action on the ground. And uh, the importance of also better defining and measuring impacts. And this is exactly the line of work on which we're starting now with a survey of PDBs. And the second line of work is on the social inclusion climate change nexus. Next stop, COP26, with an event at the IDFC Pavilion. So watch this space, follow us at, at Coalition for Social Development. And also, if you're a PDB or another interested stakeholder, join us. Thank you very much for Thank this opportunity. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Of course, I'm speaking here on behalf of the all coalitions, you know, from the secretari secretariat perspective, but it, no better than those who, who has the end of the dust uh, to speak about what they're doing. Um, and yeah, uh, just to, to finish on, on those matters, uh, we have also discussed, you know, those tremendous uh, breakthrough, you know, uh, in, in the substance. But this summit itself, and we can move to the next slide, this summit itself is an outcome of, of, of finance in common. It wasn't an easy work, and I'm joining all the thanks shared uh, with, uh, uh, by the panelists uh, to the, the CDP, the host. The first outcome of those deliverables is that uh, the G20 recognition uh, of finance in common uh, and, and, and the impact we could have on the financing SDGs and aligning uh, Paris Agreement. COP26 is around, COP15 is ongoing, and on all these uh, international summits, we have to put the world of the public development banks, the place they have uh, on finding solutions and, and complementing all the international decisions. Uh, the substantial work is still ongoing, of course. Uh, we have uh, academic, academic recognitions, I said it. Uh, 11 universities uh, have contributed on, the, on the, all the, the papers you will find on our website, thefinancingcommon.org, uh, and all the, 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 the boards and the, you know, uh, of the public development banks uh, included in this, in, this, uh, in this summit. Uh, new team members uh, we are spreading, and it's not just banks, private, se private sector, uh, philanthropy and donors, central banks, 
and financial regulatories has joined the movement uh, and expert export credit agencies too. Just to also showcase the work, uh, there are several deliverables. Uh, uh, two operational deliverables, the, the fixed progress report, I have spoken about it, you can find it online, and the update of the database, uh, if you had to you know, have a condensé of, uh, of, uh, of this work, go find those papers. Two political deliverables, of course. Uh, the fixed communique will be online uh, this afternoon and also the launch of the PDB platform for green and inclusive food system. We have spoken about it yesterday. Five academic deliverables uh, and so on. Nine thematic statements will be also published. Uh, it's not new commitments. Uh, we have you know, uh, th this joint declaration from last year. It's more of uh, showing the progress uh, we are making and also the adaptation we are taking in our journey. Just to end, uh, of course, we have a, a pro some progresses to, sh to show, but we have also some you know, work ongoing and, and, and things to do uh, later. Next steps, it's not just about the projects. Something, someone said it. Uh, it's not just about the projects, the programs. It's about a culture, how we transform the financial system. That's the main objective on what will be uh, ongoing. But we have to do it by sharing, by you know, uh, uh, keeping those partnerships on. We will keep walking the talk. We will not just keep talking these summits, but we keep walking and, and, and doing the, 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 the job. Uh, fostering a greater sense of PDB's community's identity under the banner of FIX, of course, and joining all the networks, regional networks, which I, again, thank them. Developing a range of services, such as tools, and sharing best of practices. Reinforcing the policy advocacy work. Uh, we have to have the PDB voice now, and we consolidate the voice at the international arena. Facilitating a sustainable development culture, and adopting a 100% 100% partnership based approach we have to collaborate each day every day everywhere thank you very much thank you thank you very much all right so unfortunately we have to rush a bit but not too much <laughs> because you've been very patient um, and so I think I, I'll sit here at this point but um, I'd, like to, I'd like to welcome once again Christiane Leibeck from uh, uh, KFW Development Bank to give her perspective. Uh, thank you for being with us. Yeah, no, thanks a lot and thanks for really um, outlining so colorful uh, what have, has been achieved over the last um, year and over the last couple of years. And um, to the organizers here, so thank you very much for having us here in Rome. And I think it's for all of us, we are very, very glad that we can see each other in person again, not all of us, but at least a good part of the community. Because I think personal contact is so important really to, to achieve what we all want to achieve in terms of uh, getting more effective and more um, or developing our strategies as public development banks. Um, I think it is uh, needless to say that the global challenges uh, we are facing uh, need more than, than ever, I think, in our history as, as public development banks, um, a strong cooperation. And uh, I very much like what Monica was saying just, uh, just a couple of minutes ago. It is about sharing uh, strategies and, and uh, talking about projects and, and, and so on and so forth, but it's a lot about sharing knowledge. Yeah. Because let's be very um, let's be very honest, all of us, and even those that might feel more advanced in understanding what's going on in our world, how the interlinkages are in between climate change, biodiversity, uh, sustainable growth, social uh, social impact. Uh, we are still all very much in a learning process, and um, so I think that should be one of our our major goals uh, that that we have in mind. Um, having said that, I think there's a lot, as I said, there's a lot, uh, there's already a lot going on. And um, if I only look, for example, I know we know that all have digested that on a way in, in a certain way. When I look at the sustainable development goals, I think we have to say today that they really made a major, a major 
impact on how we are thinking. When I'm just thinking as, as, as what we have developed over the last uh, year in, in KFW, which we, we call a transformation agenda, is that we link all our investments we are doing, each single investment to the sustainable development goals, not just in a qualitative approach, but in really um, de delivering what the impacts are and really show it in numbers and, and, and in, in impact what, what they are and that we do that both on the domestic side and the international side. So having a framework which we all can rely on is very important and um, in a lot of other instances when it comes to climate change, as I just said, we are still all in a learning process and we only can achieve something when we, when we harmonize our standards and systematics there. And I think there, um, here, the finance in common can, can, can achieve something really, really, really great on that. Uh, and I think it is our role as development banks um, to, um, yeah, to kind of have a proof of quality on that. I mean, we're talking nowadays a lot about greenwashing and so on and so forth. But we, as public development bank, have a political agenda with really, um, I think that there's a very important part that we are really, in our thinking and our way of establishing strategy and systematics, really um, can, uh, can have a proof of stamp and a proof of quality. Because I think, as being a public development bank community is, uh, is, is the one side of the coin, but the other is the challenges that we're facing there, how much investments are needed really to, to apply and to, to come to a transformation of economies and, and, and corporates and so on and so forth. Um, it, it really needs the private sector at the same time. And there our role as a proof of quality really um, comes, to its, um, comes to its full shine on that. Because um, uh, as I said, I think the private sector has to play a crucial role here as well. Maybe a couple of words, if, if you allow, on what we have developed as KFW. I was just already referring to the Sustainable Development Goals. On the climate side, in a, in a, in a narrower sense, um, we understand ourselves as a bank who is uh, supporting the transformation of the economies of, the, of countries, of, of, of corporates, because we think that there it's really the challenges are. There are a lot of challenges in terms of really starting to that we really have the, uh, there is the ability to find in a, from, a, from a production point of view from a, from a, for the companies to find new solutions. And I think it's not yet black and white that all can be carbon neutral and, and, and in, it's in, in one step because, but the challenge is really how do we find ways and how we support the economies and the corporates and, and the industrial sector to go that transformation path. And that's where we understand our, uh, ourselves that our role, our, role is, our role is decisively on, on, on that side. Um, that creates discussions and questions, that's for sure, but um, we, feel, we feel really good positioned, well positioned um, to do that. Yeah, so um, I think there are a lot of aspects that could be talked about here. Um, I think, as I said, a lot of linkages between climate, biodiversity and other parts. And uh, one thing we shouldn't forget ourselves, and that's maybe something we, c uh, we, could, um, we could talk here in, uh, in, in this community as well, is how can we make our, yeah, our projects, the economies and countries we work with more resilient in terms of climate because to avoid uh, greenhouse emissions is the one side, but really to protect, uh, to, pro to do something for prote uh, protection, that would be really, is really very, very important on the other side I, because I would clearly hope, clearly think that we need both. And so to, to talk about measures there, to talk about uh, insurance programs, to talk about support that we could extend there as a community, I think would be very worthwhile considering as well as a, as a topic here. Yeah, so I don't want to talk Thank too you. long. And um, as I said, um, I think um, maybe one, one last sentence. I think um, <laughs> the pandemic has really uh, has really taken a big, big impact on all of us, and in particular the countries we work with, a negative impact. But on the other side, I think, and if I look, want to look something, or want to take out something positive out of it, then I think uh, if, it's, if it needed any proof um, that cooperation among ourselves is needed, 
um, then it, it, it was shown in the pandemic. And I think with that sentiment and that sense, we should look into the future and, and, shaping, and shaping the world of, of the public development banks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I think the message about cooperation is extremely important. So, so thank you for your message. Uh, I think we online we should be connected to uh, Marcos Nito uh, of, of the UNDP. Uh, are we able to connect with him or? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Uh, there you are. Hello. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, I hate to be mean, but unfortunately, we have very, very few minutes left uh, in this panel. So uh, I, I'm warning you, I may have to interrupt you, but <laughs> it's certainly not your fault. Uh, but thank you very much for being with us. If you could give us your perspective. Thank you very much. I, I guess I get uh, extra minutes. It's uh, five in the morning in New York City. So um, <laughs> let me just say that uh, we thank him very much, CGP and, and AFD and everybody in the financing comments. Um, and congratulate you on your progress. I think we've seen a lot, a lot of progress since the first meeting in the joint declaration. We as UNDP uh, subscribers of the joint declaration as observers. And in that category, what we've done recently was to look back and say, what have we done uh, that advanced the declaration as observers? Both a couple of things that we had done last year, um, an SDG aligned framework together with the ECG as well as uh, our work at national level on the integrated financial frameworks are part of the declaration. So if you allow me to briefly just put forward what we think um, as uh, the largest development organization from the UN system with presence in 170 countries we have done in the last 12 months that supports uh, fix in advancing each declaration. I think it starts with our work as the secretariat of the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. Now, uh, which is co-chaired by the United States and China, it was set up by the Italian presidency. And I'm delighted to say that the work this year has ended with the endorsement by the G20 of a G20-wide sustainable financing roadmap for the next five years. Now, that roadmap has 19 actions, and one of these actions is about the role of international financial institutions, PDBs, you know, um, in delivering sustainability, delivering the sustainable development goals in the Paris support. We welcome and ask and invite this community here to join the Indonesian presidency as we move to implementing the G20 Sustainable Finance Roadmap. For us at UNDP, and I think we already heard a lot of conversation of greenwash, impact management um, and integrity is very important. This is why we have launched a few years back um, what we call SDG Impact Standards, which is a set of in, uh, standards that allow uh, for decision making by companies, by asset owners, and by banks. Last year, together with the OECD again, we launched um, a set of impact um, standards, which are primarily aimed at this community, the community that is in this room in Rome and all over the world. And we invite you all to work with us in absorbing and internalizing and using those standards. As a matter of fact, some of your members are already doing so. The New Development Bank uh, in China has issued a bond this year for about $767 million using the SDG impact standards for bonds. So a lot more tools and products here. And then I mentioned about the future and about creating products and tools. Some of those already exist and we are here to collaborate with you. Another important aspect for us as UNDP to offer to you um, is a series of, um, uh, we develop a tool we call SDG Investment Maps that is transforming development plans, uh, national determined contributions to the Paris Accord into sectors and subsectors of concrete investment opportunity areas. We have a global platform with those available and would urge you to have a look and perhaps find your next pipeline um, out of 250 investment opportunity areas right now in 16 countries. We're finalizing maps like those in 26 other countries. Finally, you know, our work at the national level <clears throat> and our work with governments, right? So in the joint declaration, there was a reference um, to the international to the Integrate National Financial Frameworks, INFFs. This is a job that we're doing, the program that we're leading together with the European Union 
um, and our colleagues from UNDESA, um, and is putting financing strategies behind SDG plans of governments. We are working in 71 countries. Now, those financing strategies are becoming the perfect platform by which uh, public development banks can come in to, to develop those strategies, uh, but also to figure out if that's what your shareholders, the governments, are saying it is their financing strategies. How do you drive your investments towards those financial strategies? And we are very, very delighted to facilitate your engagement in those 71 countries. We're delighted to join the Social Investment Coalition, as was already mentioned. And let me just say that we are here to carry on uh, this partnership with you all. Um, we are observers of your declaration, but we are observers just in name. We are an active engagement partner of you. We've got products, we've got tools, and we've got a presence that match all your membership. So we can be your partner almost anywhere in the world. I'll stop here uh, thank you. to support your time management. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you for being with us. It was extremely important to have you, and I apologize for the time issues. <laughs> um, I think uh, we have a final uh, message from Eric Lombard, am I correct? Uh, the CEO of Caisse de Depot et Consignation. Uh, that should be uh, a video recorded message, if, if that is correct. Okay, so it's, uh, it's coming. And uh, again, thank you for bearing with us because it's a hybrid event. So we have people in the audience, we have people, but we're very happy to have you here physically, of course, but we also have people online uh, and we're managing the different platforms and the different uh, digital systems. Is, do we have the video or? Uh, I could not yeah? Thank you. join you in Rome this year, but I wanted to take this opportunity to share a few words with you one year after the launch of the Finance in Common initiative. Last year in Paris with my friend Rémi Riou and across the globe online, we underlined the crucial role public banks and financial institutions have to play to build a resilient economy, to successfully face the COVID-19 crisis by supporting recovery plans at national and continental levels. And above all, to foster the massive investments we need to address climate change and to ensure the transition to a greener and fairer economy. Both issues demand quick action and a capacity to sustain the real economy in the long run through efficient projects and business funding. Debt alone is not sufficient to help business grow. And the projects and solutions that we need to achieve the green transition require massive equity financing. There is a need for equity and the need for financial institutions ready to share the risks. In my view, this is our first duty as public development banks. As I explained during our last summit, Caisse de Depot Group committed over 26 billion euros in equity over the next five years to support the sectors that were heavily impacted by the lockdown and sanitary measures while remaining on track with our ambition to promote sustainable and inclusive development with a strong focus on the ecological transition through a massive climate plan with BPI France or joint venture with the French state. One year later, we have already injected over 10 billion euros in the French economy, representing 40% of our overall target. Achieving an effective economic recovery and promoting ecological transition at a global scale is no easy task, and it cannot be carried out alone. As public banks and financial institutions, we have the capacity to trigger such a cooperation by promoting joint action between ourselves and with the private sector. It also requires cooperation at international level, for instance, through the Net Zero Alliance. Alongside the founding members, Caisse de Depot aim to accelerate toward carbon neutrality in asset management globally. By reaffirming public development banks' commitment to act together to build a stronger future, 
the second financing common summit is an important step forward. I would like to thank all of the organizers, especially Dario Scanapieco and Remy Rieu, and to offer my continued support to this initiative. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and thank you to all our panelists, thank you to our audience once again. Uh, thank you for being with us, Adama Marico, of course, and uh, Christian Leibach, and uh, remotely, uh, Marcos Neto. So we'll quickly move to the next <laughs> part. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right, and so our next panel will look to the future uh, while we <laughs> arrange that. Uh, so we, we've done all the different steps. We've done you know, the past, the present, and now the future. Um, so now we will continue continue to talk about, you know, we've laid the groundwork for the next step of the coalition's work, you know, how do we move on from here? Uh, the, the title of the next panel is Future Priorities, Bringing New Forces to Finance Sustainable Development. So uh, I think that's a key theme. Um, and uh, I'd like, therefore, to call on stage Sergei Storchak, uh, the senior banker of the Bank of Development and Foreign Economic Affairs uh, of Russia. Thank you and welcome. Uh, then Joanna Nyman, Head of Inclusive Green Finance of Alliance for Financial Inclusion. Um, is she here? <laughs> or and we have Patrick Daimini, President of the Development Bank of South Africa. And Anton Lais Garcia, the CEO of AICID. Thank you, welcome. Um, and then uh, at the end of the panel, we will have some messages. So uh, I think the most important thing is, is <laughs> to get us started. And thank you for being with us. So Mr. Storchak, I'd like to begin with you. Uh, which specific needs does the uh, FICS coalition meet? And what, what are the expectations regarding the next joint steps? And also, how is your national experience on green investments how can it be a best practice for the coalition? We'd love to hear more about your national experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. The agenda is very wide, but I would like to start with a big thanks to our colleagues from CDP for yesterday's event. We really enjoyed being in this wonderful place. We enjoyed the spectacle. Uh, I forgot when I was had chance to see something like. So thank you very much for this initiative. Not only the initiative taking all of us, all of us together, but to take us to this wonderful place and see the actions. So dear, dear colleagues, second year of pandemic is coming to uh, to an end. A year ago, many of us saw that the virus would be finally defeated by November this year. But this is, has not happening, unfortunately. New various, uh, variant of viruses are emerging and decrease is spreading. Just we received a news from Israel that a girl which came from the Republic of Moldova brought uh, to, uh, with her another type of viruses. It's happened yesterday. So, uh, we have found ourselves in confront, uh, confronted uh, uh, by a new reality. The emergency of measures taken by many of us last year to support health system and national economies widely regarded as temporary, and in my case it was for sure, may become permanent. This will have a strong influence of our mandates and probably on our business strategies. The new reality requires joint actions. The pandemic is a unique opportunity to rethink the current state of play and stimulate our activities and partnership on the rails of green economies, sustainable development goals, and ECG oriented governments. So lots of words were uh, being said today and yesterday about this. And it looks like the emergent, uh, consensus emerged that uh, Public development banks can work together and be very effective in this field. 
We, we believe that the initiative of International Development Finance Cl Club to establish uh, our coalition, uh, the Finance and Commerce Summit, can be viewed as a real breakthrough in the multilateral cooperations. My personal uh, feelings is a real breakthrough. The initiative embraces vital, many vital areas. We talked about this uh, uh, this morning. But what was the most important, that the voice of, of coalition and its, its members need and should be heard by all important um, international forums, such as G20, United Nations, International Monetary, Monetary and Financial Committee, BIS, FSB, credit rating agencies, and uh, many, many others. So, uh, unfortunately, we haven't heard anything about the, uh, our colleagues from the United States, whether they are with us on board or not. So probably at the end of the, our sessions, someone will uh, describe this or say that I am not right. WEB is implement, implement its own transformation strategy to give a sharp focus on protecting the environment, improving well-being of people and communities, introducing best practices in governments. According to IDFA methodology, green projects have already taken up more than one third of our portfolio. It's not our judgment. It is very important that it's the judgment of, the, of our club. So, and we are ready to move further. We are active in financing electric transport, clean energy sources, as well as helping the Russian manufacturers to switch to low carbon uh, technology. So, uh, staying in Rome, I was a bit surprised that I haven't seen any of electrical buses. So, please come to Moscow to see how uh, well uh, we have moved, <laughs> moved in these we directions. <laughs> it's not small buses, it's really big ones, which was uh, taking passages around the Rome with, uh, you know, diesel engines in most cases. Uh, the EB has a government mandate to develop Russia's national taxonomy for green projects. Last month, the corresponding document was approved by the Russian government. So Russia has become one of the few countries with their own national taxonomies. We have already started promoting our, uh, our taxonomy dom dom domestically and uh, we present it to international community at uh, COVID. 26. It, it is what is very important uh, for us that 90, uh, our taxonomy is 95% compliant with the new U.S. taxonomy. And we hope that it will be received uh, uh, by the business and expert communities uh, with all necessary uh, <laughs> applause, I would like to say. At the same time, we need to uh, take into account the specific uh, needs of, the, of Russian citizens and Russian uh, uh, economies. You know how climate is uh, different in Russia in comparison to many other parts of the world. So, uh, transaction to clean urgent, uh, energy should be great, uh, great deal and address above all to the needs of the people. So, it's big challenge for us to comply with the world tendencies in the field of green economy and to, be, uh, to stay in real life uh, of our citizens. To conclude, I'd w uh, I would like to mention another important topic. Uh, this is the uh, access to long-term uh, long funding for public development banks. One of the colleagues today said that it's not the, the, the issue. Maybe for some of us it's not of the issue, but not for us. Decarbonization and uh, energy transition require huge investment. As we estimated, Russia will need to spend an equivalent of uh, about 15% of its GDP every year until 2060 in order to become car carbon neutral. You can imagine that it's rather difficult uh, to finance uh, when you do not have access to external funding. But uh, we, 
uh, state cor uh, development corporation and, and quite a lot of other financial entities find it rather difficult to have access to international capital markets. We think that these re restrictions are unfair in general and especially unfair in the context of uh, financing uh, uh, for cross-border green projects. So climate issues and the related processes have no respect to political boundaries, limiting the ability of, of Russia's entities to raise capital for decarbonization means putting obstacles in the way of the Paris Agreement. Maybe a bit exaggeration, but, well, from our point of view, it's real true. We believe that all restrictions of this kind need to be lifted, at least in the case of financial instruments and projects recognized and as green in accordance with internationally uh, developed taxonomies and uh, verification systems. We are open to work together with the coalition members on all these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your very candid uh, intervention. Uh, it's very much appreciated. And now let me welcome online, I believe, uh, Joanna Nyman. She's head of inclusive green finance uh, and uh, Alliance for Financial Inclusion. Do we, do we have a connection or uh, shall I move on? <laughs> Maybe, yes, because I, I believe we have several speakers that are online, so that's always a bit of a challenge. Nyo, maybe? Yes? All right. Yes. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. We can't see you, unfortunately, but we can hear you. Uh, it's important that you can hear us. That's essential. <laughs> um, are we able to get a video image or...? Yeah, okay, it's coming. Um, I may uh, jump in and ask you the question if you can hear me, however. Absolutely. All right, <laughs> thank you so much. So, um, your alliance of central banks and regulatory actors has um, recently come closer to the fixed coalition. So how can your alliance support the global advocacy on sustainable and green finance? And, and what trends do you currently observe? And I apologize, but I also have to ask you to to have a quick and tight intervention because we are running a bit late. But of course, uh, you know, go ahead with what you need <laughs> to say. Thank you. Is she back or have we lost her? Sorry. Ah, we can see you. Yes. Fabulous. All yes. right. Thank you so much. Yes. Could you, could you give us our pers your perspective and your view? And we're very happy to yes, have you. Yes, absolutely. On so first of all, a big thank you to CDP, AFP and the Partners of Finance in Common. I'll, I'll try to channel my, my origins of being Finnish and be short and, and to the point on, on this thank one. You. So I'm representing a network of 100 financial regulators and central banks from emerging and developing economies. And this network is specifically focusing on financial inclusion. So I'm going to uh, bring to you an additional perspective to green finance that I don't believe has been discussed so far here today. Uh, and it's really focusing on the intersect between green and equitable, which was mentioned earlier by Sebastian Trier, mm -hmm. and also the report coming out of EPPG. And this is the perspective of inclusive green finance. It's focusing on advancing resilience building and enabling mitigation of contributions to climate change and environmental degradation through financial inclusion. So very clearly having access to formal savings, it's a way of buffer buffering against cost increases, uh, diver diversifying risks, but also assisting in accessing credit and accelerating recovery and reconstruction. Having access to credit itself, uh, green credit primarily, it's a way to be able to invest in low carbon technologies, to rebuild and to reconstruct after natural disasters, but also to invest in resilient housing and more climate smart or more resilient agriculture. Uh, and also, of course, as we heard earlier as well, having access to insurance products, but also payment systems that provides resilience in a time of crisis and accelerates recovery and reconstruction, but can also lead to investments and buffers against climate change impact. So this is really the definition of how in access to financial products and services can one, build resilience, and two, enable mitigation amongst those that are uh, absolutely the most vulnerable, um, in the most vulnerable countries as well. Uh, and I want to stress that being SDG aligned, it's not only about capital markets, green and sustainable bonds, it's also about the smaller scale. And I want to echo Christine Leibach earlier, who was talking about the essence of resilience building. 
and, and also having access to financial services and products is a way of empowering for a just transition. And also a way of reaching the last mile of green finance, as we heard from the, the previous speakers. How do we reach those that need it the most? And without access to financial services and products, that's very complicated. So just to conclude, we work with regulators. And as mentioned earlier, this is a question of risks and financial stability. Uh, and at the core of these financial stability risks, we have the vulnerable populations. Uh, and thus, inclusive green finance and specific greening and resilience building products and services are being one of the most important solutions in our green finance toolbox today. Uh, and our network, we see quite a lot of action in the past years. Uh, everything from strategies at the national level, sustainable banking principles, green national financial inclusion strategies, green finance strategies, to very specific initiatives and policies. As mentioned earlier in the intervention, taxonomies, lending quotas, refinancing facilities, credit guarantees, innovation investment funds, and sandboxes. The examples are quite many, but what is really nice to see, and of course what I work with on a full-time basis, is to see these advances from the regulatory perspective. So regulation and policy coming in place. And of course, in advancing inclusive green finance, the PDBs are naturally at the core, and, and it's paramount that everybody is included in this massive transition and the quite large transformation we have ahead of us. So that's my perspective on the future. That is inclusive green finance. Thank you. Thank so you so much. Uh, much appreciated, and thank you for sharing us with us your perspective. Um, uh, the next uh, panelist is uh, Patrick Diamini, uh, president of the Development Bank of South Africa. Uh, excuse me. So, um, are we connected? I think we were, but... Yes, we uh, should be. Yes? I'm not sure if you can see me on your side. Not yet, but I am confident that we will see you very shortly. So, what's important <laughs> is that you can hear us. Ah, uh, perfect. We yes. see you and it's, it's perfect image. So, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, could you tell us more about the studies uh, uh, by IDFC on climate and biodiversity and which are the main achievements in line uh, with the Paris Agreements? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Program Director. Uh, and, and, and thank you very much to CDB for hosting this auspicious event. Uh, we are grateful also to the Fixed Secretary General and the team. And, 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 and thank you so much to my dear friend, Mr. Remy Ru of AFD for really galvanizing the public development banks and also making sure that, that globally we are all aligned and all pushing for what is, is so critical to the world. But again, I, I want to also greet all the leadership of the public development banks and the multilateral development banks present and virtually. Really, and as IDFC, uh, Madam Program Director, we are very proud that we've been quite uh, proactive under the leadership of, of AFD in making sure that we play our part both in terms of SDG as well as, as aligning with the, with, with the Paris Accord. So as AFDFC, we have published this year an operational framework supported by two independent think tanks, the New Climate Institute, as well as the Institute of Climate Economics. For all, which actually provide clear and practical guidance on how IDFC members and financial community at large can reach a better alignment of their strategies, programs, operations, so that there is proper alignment as per the Paris Agreement. I must highlight, Madam Program Director, that cumulatively green finance commitment by IDFC members has surpassed one trillion US dollars since the Paris agreement was signed. This is indeed a very major milestone for IDFC members as we have been able to demonstrate our ability and to be able to deliver at unprecedented scale the flows of green finance. Again, Madam Chair, this one trillion committed to green climate finance since 2015 has exceeded the initial commitment of reaching this threshold by 2025. But again, what this talks to is also our 185 billion US dollars just in 2020. So this translates to about 20% of new commitments by IDFC members on green climate. Again, this is something that we all are 
really encouraging all our partners globally to see how we can begin to have a set aside of all our new commitments to green climate uh, uh, financing. And adaptation projects accounted for about 27.4 billion, which is up by 42% from 2019 levels. And this is five times more since 2016, Madam Chair. And again, I think our IDFC members really deserve a major congratulations for this and an encouragement to try and do much more because this tells us that it is quite possible. In light of the new priorities triggered by the economic response to the COVID-19 pandemic, IDFC institutions redistributed the green finance efforts towards adaptation and resilience, whilst also including more conservation efforts. Indeed, at the inaugural 2020 Finance and Commons, IDFC members committed to step up investment in their conservation, sustainable use, and restoration of biodiversity. This, Madam Chair, talks also to 14 billion US dollars that was committed to biodiversity in 2020 alone. Biodiversity finance is mentioned for the first time in green and climate finance mapping. And again, it's a very, very commendable development, Madam Chair, that we have begun to embrace the twin uh, challenges that have got to be addressed by the world, this, which is people, which talks to social equity, as well as nature. So because if we were to ensure that we address these issues, I know you are not touched on inclusive finance, it's quite important that for the sustainability of people, nature has got to be very much a critical part of it. So it is also quite important that through our strategic global partnerships with institutions like the Green Climate Fund, as well as the Global Environmental Facility, and these institutions have been quite uh, uh, helpful in their concessional funding in helping us to improve our impacts on our clients, uh, the beneficiaries of our projects, and, 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 and what we're trying to do, Madam Chair, as IDFC members, is to see how do we make I, uh, uh, SDG 17, the global coalition, a, a real reality. As you know that IDFC members, they struggle across all continents of the world. And that also is to be very much welcome, as this is what we believe, that if we want to strive for global commons, and to do what we best can be able to do as the global citizens. We have to find ways of working together and also of catalyzing each other. And in all of this, we all understand that global governments, as well as public development banks and multilateral development banks, on our own, we won't be able to achieve much. But it is if we realize our strategic niche that we have to play in making sure that we are able to catalyze the private sector capital into these critical projects. Because when we begin to do that, that's where we'll be able to see much more bigger impact. And, and Madam Chair, I really am quite excited at the mission that has been shown by our IDFC members in really making sure that green climate financing is not only a lip service, but something that we begin to live something that influences our behaviors, something that influences our strategic initiatives in our respective institutions and how we are working and supporting our respective governments and our respective countries and regions to make sure that the move towards Paris Agreement is a move by all parts of the world. We also understand that the emerging markets and the least developed countries, they need much more help from the developed nations. And it is through that that we can be able to make sure that the 2050 commitment to net zero emissions becomes a reality. But as a development bank of Southern Africa, we have been quite busy ourselves in driving our just transition investment framework. This talks to how are we going to make sure that our net zero achievement come 2050 is achieved and how to make sure that our trajectory to that point talks to our portfolio as we are moving forward. 
Thank but you. I'm also quite um, uh, happy, uh, Madam Chair, to share with the fixed participants here Sorry. today that the South African government, in terms of its nationally determined contributions, have been quite uh, aggressive. In the past six weeks, they have revised their targets in terms of emissions by 2025 as well as by 2030. And that this, Madam Chair, it gives us hope that as an institution and as a country with a power utility in the form of our ESCO as being the biggest emitter, we will be able to see the country coming forward how we are going to transition away from fossil fuel because that is an absolutely critical for ourselves as well as our country to make sure that we work with the rest of the world in trying to make sure that we minimize our greenhouse gas emissions. But what is also encouraging... Th thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm really, really sorry to interrupt you, but unfortunately we're coming to the end of the session. So I, I want to avoid uh, <laughs> that the video is actually interrupted itself. So uh, I, I apologize, uh, but we, we need to conclude. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, thank you very much. But thank you for your contribution. And I, what I really appreciate about as sessions is actually that we've been able to have a contribution from all over the world. So we, from Russia to South Africa to uh, South America, etc. Um, last but not least, obviously, before our video messages, uh, we have uh, uh, Anton Leis Garcia. And thank you for being with us. If, if you could give us your contribution, brief but full. And <laughs> quality, not quantity. <laughs> Th thank you, Alessandra. I'm going to try to help. Uh, I'm going to be brief. Let me just thank uh, the organizer of this uh, wonderful event for uh, hosting us here in Rome. That's something people following remotely are missing out, but this is a fantastic location. So I want to thank uh, Dario, Remy, Adama, and the entire team behind this, this initiative, and also uh, more generally for all the work done since last year on putting together this platform and encouraging joint action by public development banks. Uh, let me start with a message about the needs. I think this morning Antonella mentioned uh, challenge, imperative, and opportunity. And I think the sheer size of these three elements of the challenge and the imperative and the opportunities is, is incredible. Huh? Uh, we have 2.5 million uh, US dollars in financing gap for the SDGs annually, and that was before the pandemic. The needs have increased dramatically. Um, I cannot tell you about uh, public health, economic resilience, inclusion, and of course, planet. Um, and we have a clear roadmap, which is the SDGs, and in particular SDG uh, 17, which uh, tells us about the how. The how is one word, this partnership is working together. And that's a spirit that has also inspired the creation of Team Europe uh, within the European Union, among uh, member states, the European Commission, and all actors, including public development banks. That was a spirit uh, that um, was born in April 2020 to respond to the pandemic that has become structural now. Uh, it is also part, it is inspiring the programming of our work for the next seven years as part of global Europe. Europe plays a fundamental role in everything we are talking here today. Um, as, uh, the European Union provides and member states provide 60% of ODA and uh, we are the leading provider of climate finance. And we felt we, meaning IFID, but also our like-minded partners at IFD, KFW, and CDP, um, thought that it was important to take uh, this to the next level based on our shared values uh, and interests as a, a community of public development banks and development agencies. We are very different institutions, uh, but diversity is our strength, um, and we are united and we share the common vision of working better together and working in this uh, Team Europe spirit. So that's what we set up this uh, in 2016, this enhanced partnership with the European uh, Commission, and we have since engaged very um, uh, heavily on, through formal and informal channels to work together. And we are today uh, taking it to the next level. Uh, today we are signing a joint declaration on a European uh, strategic framework that is going to make our alliance, our cooperation more strategic, more political. Um, we want to speak with one voice or at least uh, sing to the same tune, uh, both in the European Union and, and, and beyond, and that's the tune of the SDGs and, and, and SDG 17 in, in particular. We want to share pipelines, we want to start working together. 
in 2022, we're going to take it, uh, we're going to um, uh, switch gears and, 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 and go to a higher speed uh, by signing a co-financing framework agreement and we'll put the money where the uh, mouth is. Uh, we will be leveraging uh, not just finance, uh, the money we all have, but also knowledge and experiences. This is an open partnership. Uh, we are starting these four like-minded European institutions, but we want to contribute to debates in Europe and at the global level. And we want to work with all of you. Uh, again, I finish with um, echoing the words of Antonella about the importance of this challenge, the importance of this imperative and this opportunity. And we need to indeed work together and take this platform to, to the next level. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to all our panelists. Uh, it's really been a pleasure for me to be here. I'd really like to thank Fix. I'd like to thank Casa Depositi, of course, uh, for the opportunity. It, it has been enriching. Um, we have uh, two more video messages. Uh, one is from uh, Michael Ron, president of the Bern Union and chief international officer of SACE, and Jay Collins, vice chairman of corporate and investment banking of Citigroup and GISD representative. So uh, thanks again to our audience, uh, to everyone here and everyone at home or, or at work who is watching us. Thank you very much. That's it from me. Hello, everybody. And a very big thanks to the president, Remy Riu, and to Antonella Baldino from Casa Depositi for inviting me today here with you. I am extremely pleased to address you today on behalf of the Bern Union, which is the International Union of Credit and Investment Insurers. As a union, we are truly global, a global community with 81 members coming from 66 countries, including all the world's export credit agencies, the largest private underwriters of credit and political risk insurance, as well as multilateral financial institutions. Last year, 2020, the Bern Union members provided credit insurance cover for over 2.4 trillion US dollars of exports. That's the equivalent of more than 13% of global trade. And on top of this, an additional $70 billion were provided by the Bern Union members last year for political risk insurance cover in support of foreign investments and another $83 billion were channeled towards domestic support for exporters. As you can appreciate, these are huge amounts that provide you with an insight into the role of credit insurance as a very important driver of the real economy. And as such, clearly even more critical its role in the recovery phase. The membership of the Bern Union is extremely diverse and heterogeneous. It is an extraordinary example of multilateralism and inclusiveness as we bridge the gap between insurers from advanced and emerging economies, as well as fostering a dialogue between Eastern and Western Hemisphere and organizations with different mandates and institutional setups. The Bern Union throughout the years has developed outreach initiatives with development finance institutions and multilaterals we engage with stakeholders from across the wider community of international finance, such as today with finance in common. Within this framework, the Bern Union is currently focusing its efforts on climate finance and its increasing relevance for the export credit and credit insurance industry. Our current priorities are therefore in full synergy with Finance in Common, and for this reason, we have happily agreed to provide an official acknowledgement of the joint declaration signed last year by you, by the public development banks. The Bern Union therefore acknowledges the common goals set by the public development banks under the joint declaration which includes supporting the transformation of the global economy towards sustainable development, as well as contributing to the SDGs and the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Moving forward, the Bern Union encourages joint initiatives 
between our institutions in the spirit of cooperation between finance and insurance. To conclude, despite the different, very different mandates and objectives of our associations, in recent years, development finance, export finance and credit insurance have explored common grounds. I believe that this facilitated arriving to present day, creating a huge opportunity and the right momentum to build new schemes of cooperation. So the acknowledgement of the joint declaration effectively represents an unprecedented step that reinforces the partnership between the Bern Union and Finance in Common. Future initiatives of the Bern Union already foresee the involvement of Finance in Common. And I trust that this is just the beginning of our collaboration. And yes, we do have a very long but exciting way to go. Thank you. Need to take the portion of risk that the private sector can't take. Um, or doesn't take so efficiently, and uh, to use those structures uh, and that catalytic role, particularly around the highest uh, priority projects for achieving the SDGs. Five is to promote greater harmonization of mobilization and blended structures that will increase speed, scale of deployment. Um, the more we harmonize, the, the, the more we can do. Six, align investments with ESG climate and green finance themes and mitigate risk to attract investors that have ESG uh, and other such themes like climate investing and climate impact as, as a priority. Um, that is so important because ultimately um, ESG is a market-based paradigm and uh, many of the investors growing in size and absolute aggregate amounts uh, will need risk mitigation uh, to take um, to take the risk of the developing markets and the frontier markets, um, but they fit into theme patterns around the ESGs, and the more we, um, the more we uh, bucket them into those categories, the more private sector funding we'll have. Next is number seven, um, which is much greater focus on helping to create uh, and structure investable pipelines for the private sector, and to develop a marketplace that houses these opportunities. Um, of course, the development uh, bank community has the ability to help structure more, uh, to help innovate in the creation of bankable pipeline. Uh, without pipeline, uh, we can't scale blending, and we also need a marketplace that is um, that really centralizes around the world uh, the the investment opportunities to make it easier for investors. Uh, eight and final is the private sector investors often make their investment decisions based on track record of investment performance, and yet the track record data in the emerging markets, particularly in the frontier markets, is very poor uh, and in times even unavailable. And, and without that track record analysis, without that track record data, it's, it's difficult for both debt and equity investors to have uh, – uh, to make the investment decisions. Um, so these are the eight that are, are, are cited. I think it's important uh, uh, that you take a look at the report and, and look at some of the specifics in it and that we all um, have as an objective to, uh, to blend more uh, to achieve the SDGs. Thank you very much.